I'm ready to go because it's Sunday morning and I just want to talk about real estate, Daryl. And I don't know what to do. It's so exciting. I can't I can't get away from it. We want to take a weekend off, but we just can't do it. We can't do it to the listeners. We can't do it to ourselves. I got to know. It's just not fair to anybody if we take a day off. I got to know what you know, Daryl. Tell me. We don't talk as much during the week anymore. You've been busier. I've been busier. So we, busy, right? We save all the good stuff for the show. I feel like I'm busy doing nothing or getting nowhere, but you're uh, going somewhere, man. Five out of six, baby. Five out of six. Contract, yeah. Now yeah. it's time to uh, go after the, the the final piece of the puzzle, the, the holdout, the cornerstone, the, the more most important piece of the whole thing. Of course, the, on, the only one that really matters. The only one that you know really how to, matters. You know how to sweeten the pot. You know how to make the deal work. You know how to, you know, tickle their fancy. Well, you know that there's the underlying, you know, thing going on in the background that makes it even more exciting and tricky than normal. Right. So we'll see how that goes. But I've got it as far as I could get it up until now. Yes. And now it's time to deploy mm. phase two. Phase two. Phase two. Which is, is that like, where you bring out the sharks? It's where I bend over and uh, get ready. OK. For you, outrageous, bring up the, the, outrageous number and outrageous demands. The feeder fish. Way to go. Yeah. So, it. yeah, I mean. I feel like things aren't happening though, because I feel like I'm kind of giving up on a lot of stuff. I feel like things are just really hard to make happen. Yeah. There's there's a there's a there's a spread right now between reality and expectations. Reality and prices. <clears throat> yeah. So where reality is and what needs to happen to make these commercial investment deals work and where sellers' expectations are. Like they just want buyers to just not make any money they're like well too bad i you know just do the deal anyways i don't care what your interest rate is i don't care how hard it is to get capital oh, you're gonna you get to 40 my stories you're gonna be fine don't worry you don't need to make money i need to make money my neighbor's yeah cleaning lady told me you're gonna get like 43 stories on this absolutely so yeah. like i'm worth this i know remember that building that they built in like oakville like six years ago yeah i went to that hearing i know how these things work Right. I know that's Oakville and I live in Scarborough, but that's still something that's relevant to this conversation. And I know all about your plan. Right. My And my friend just sold their house, my friend, and they just sold it to somebody who's an investor. OK. And like, believe me, this house, like it's a premium location. Right. Like they way undersold it. And, really? you know, that investor, they knew what they were doing. And I'm not going to be like my friend. I'm not going to get taken advantage of by you. Because you can just make all this money that I don't know about, right? Uh, where's your Where's your house look located? It's at Jane and Finch, but uh, you know, just let me know when you're going to bring me the offer, okay? <laughs> yeah, the one I was dealing with yesterday was. Um, do you think we're gonna like? It's like it's not Greenbelt, but it's Oak Ridge's Moraine. Do you think the the developers are going to pay us more, like, if we wait? And I said, yes, if you wait for twenty years. This property is going to be worth a lot more money, right? But nobody's going to buy this property today because you can't build on it. You know, there is there is no options to build today. I'm assuming that the person you're talking to is not, you know, one of the major development families in the city of Toronto that's able to unlock the potential of the green belt. I asked them and they said no. Well, I said, Do you guys have the the power to unlock the potential? In Oak Ridge's Moraine, and they said, "Not today." Well, if you want to talk to people that can unlock the potential of things, TK, I even have a surprise for you today. This episode is brought to you by Landlord. This Landlord software is a game changer. You upload your properties, right? You upload all the information, income, expenses, timelines, mortgage details, everything that you need to have so that you keep track of everything in your portfolio. And as you go through real time adjustments in, you know, rent increases and uh, water bills and, and tax bills and everything else, they're going to actually give you recommendations on how to 
make your portfolio more efficient. And it just breaks everything down for me in a way that I've never seen before. Like Excel spreadsheets just don't cut it. I don't think there's a better program or app out there for investors and it's free. Please click the link below for your free trial offer. Oh, really? Yeah, not only do we have Mr. Greg Ewens, Beautiful. but we have his partner in crime, the owner of Batori Planning and Management, Mr. Paul We are going to get to some answers today. I love it. We are, we have a, a bonus. <laughs> Nothing but answers today. I think today is actually going to be much closer to what our viewers crave from us when they when yes. they watch us every week. They, they want, want the information and they want facts and all they get is goofy anecdotes. Mm. But and, today and, and today, lousy backgrounds and lousy backgrounds. But today, yeah. today, we're going to change everything because we got some heavy hitters here who are going to who are going to help us understand what the fuck is going on with Bill 23. Welcome, TK. gentlemen. Big hey guys. Day. Welcome, Greg. Good to see you again, Paul. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, TK. Welcome to the thanks show. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So we're yeah, here to thanks for being here. Get as much information as uh, you know as we can. Um, Greg, can you give us an update? Because last time we spoke to you, you were working for the city of Toronto, and uh, where are you at today, Greg? Well, now I'm working with Paul. I uh, I left the city in the fall after about 13 years uh, of working in city planning, and it's uh, it's been a big change. But I'm I'm really happy with the move, and uh, I'm having a great time working with Paul and all these fun projects we're getting a chance to work on. You know, in Toronto, outside of Toronto, and uh, I've I've really been enjoying the last few months. It's been great. So I can't yeah. speak for Paul whether he's been enjoying me. Uh, the oh yeah, you know, it's... I'm sure he has. Yeah, Must be so. horrible for Paul. <laughs> Paul, why don't you introduce yourself? You've never been on the show before. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Just a quick anecdote. Greg and I started off our careers together at the uh, municipality of Whitby as a uh, as planners at the beginning of our careers, and uh, we both parted ways for a bit, um, but now we're bringing the band back together. And it's been uh, it's been pretty fun. So uh, yeah, I started off my career uh, working eight years at the uh, municipal level of government in more of the 905 municipalities, both in Whitby and Oakville, um, and then um, you know decided to bring out a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, and that's when I started uh, Batori uh, after leaving uh, after leaving the municipal world, and uh, so. Basically, since 2015, been doing um, uh, planning consulting work uh, on behalf of clients across the uh, across the GTA. So, TK, who better to have here today to, to help us figure this out? Because if you read the headlines, I mean, holy cow, you can't tell if people are happy about it or sad about it or angry about it. I mean, the headlines I'm reading, I, I see a hell of a lot more anger than I do uh, uh, praise. Let's first talk about what it is. Yeah, what is Bill 23? The More Homes Built Faster Act. Yep. So so Bill 23, it's it's now law uh, actually. It was uh, it's piece yeah. of legislation that was introduced by the province. It's uh it's, you know, the next in a series of legislation that they've brought in the, into force uh, since they were elected. And there was originally the I believe it was the More Homes More Choice Act. Um, and then there was the, um, oh, I can't recall the second one. Um, more, more homes, homes for, for everyone. everyone. More homes for everyone. And then more homes Yee-hee! built faster. So there's a theme, right? And and they all they all did different things. I won't talk about the other ones necessarily, but a lot of them have made some fairly substantial changes to the way land use planning happens in Ontario, the way applications are processed, uh, the way, um, you know, policies apply to, to different areas and the responsibilities of municipalities and keeping their policies up to date and moving their processes along uh, in a certain way and, and things that are required of, of applicants um, and uh, and municipalities. And also the latest bill, um, bill More Homes Built Faster, um, changes up a bunch of the, the finance aspect of development, whether it's development charges, parks, levies, or other things, in, in addition to many, many other um, aspects of the proposal. So I, I thought we'd kind of walk through sort of a summary of some of the, the high points that might be of okay. interest to people, and then we can just talk about them. Um, Paul, did you have anything else to say by way of uh, an introduction? No, I wanted no. to say subscribe to the channel <laughs> right now. 
Yeah, yeah. No, Greg, jump right into it. I'm really excited to talk about the nuance to some of these uh, these changes to the legislation. For sure. Well, let's let's start with one of the ones that um, was actually adjusted a bit after getting announced. So the the prohibition on third party appeals. So yes. when Bill 23 was originally announced, uh, the bill removed the ability for third parties to appeal all sorts of planning applications. So if you were applying to amend the zoning or the official plan on your property, or you were submitting a minor variance application to build an addition to your house or a consent application to sever a property into two or more, then you, and you received uh, approval from the municipality, then you could not be appealed by a third party. And so that, that's a, that was a big deal. And there was some concern that was registered about that, uh, mostly in the case of zoning and official plan amendment applications, because what it meant was that in practice, if you own a property and the city or the region or, or you know, whoever goes in and uh, amends policies on your property or next to your property in a way that might limit the opportunity for you to develop your property in the future, you would have no appeal rights. And so there were a lot of people you know, talking about this implication. And I think the the province went and they made a change to Bill 23 last week before the bill was enacted to uh, kind of roll that back. There is still uh, a, a prohibition on third party appeal rights for minor variances and consents, which I think is generally a good thing, uh, though. I think it's important to look at the changes to the bill through the lens of, you know, will it create more homes built faster? And, you know, in this particular case, there's probably a marginal benefit here. You know, you're not, oh, there isn't a ton of new housing that goes through the committee process. You know, there, there is to an extent. Um, through the consent process, you're creating new lots, you're ostensibly creating more housing. When you remove the opportunity for third party appeals, those things move a little bit faster. That is a good thing in my view. Um, but uh, Paul, what, what are your thoughts? But just that? for minor variances and severances? That's where that's where the bill is right now. So third party appeal rights are still a thing for zoning and official plan amendment applications. Whether right. the province comes back in the new year uh, and sort of re approaches that in a different way, we'll, we'll have to see. So that speeds up eight houses. OK, sorry, Paul, what were you going to say? I think the other um, potential like cascading benefit of the third party appeals, although it's only been removed for minor variances and consents, there's a lot of applications that are before the tribunal, um, whether it's the T-Lab or whether it's the Ontario Land Tribunal that do deal with these types of applications. And in theory, that helps potentially solve some of the backlog uh, that the tribunal deals with and focus more on, frankly, more high profile and prominent applications to assist in uh, right. in those in those files. The other thing that I think this does, it, it's a bit of a psychological barrier for some people that say you want to submit an application for a, you know, a triplex, you know, you want to build a triplex on your property, need some variances, and you're worried that your neighbors are going to be pissed off and they might appeal the application. Well, this is no longer a concern. So you might then they oh, okay, you know, I have more certainty, I'm going to proceed with this application. Again, that's a good thing. So just based on that one policy alone, you feel like this will create at least quoting Daryl here, eight more homes, but it's it's a positive. It's a net growth in the amount of homes. homes being applied for and for the timeline that it would take for them to get approved, correct? Yeah, I, I think maybe more than eight. Um, no, but I, I mean, generally speaking, that wherever you can introduce more certainty into a process and, and the right. timing around that process, I think that's a good thing for the creation of housing and for projects moving forward. So, so at the Paul, committee level, this does that. Paul the made an interesting point where, where it, there's like a cascading effect where it frees, not only does it not waste time dealing with these stupid things, but it frees up more time to deal with things that are less stupid. Hopefully. <laughs> The reason I say that is because the federal government has a history of creating programs and policies that don't work. Don't work. Right. So, you know, provincially, is this something that could add, Take you know, the, the benefit? I mean, based on the title alone, like it does it create more homes faster? And and what you're saying is yeah, it's a it's a positive policy. So that's good to hear. Well, that part yeah. of it helps for sure. Yeah. Literally. There's there's Certainly. I mean, there's there's a lot in the bill. It's a, it's a dense piece of legislation. Um, I mean, I, I think with regard to the feds, you know, the feds, the province and the cities all have to step up in the ways that they're able to to help create additional housing. You know, there really there really should be, you know, a national or provincial home builder that is building that is just cranking out 
um, you know, co-ops and affordable housing and, and other forms of, of subsidized housing. Like that would be uh, a fantastic thing that could be, that could really, I think, put a dent in not only the housing supply issue across the, the province and the country really, uh, but really address the, the, the affordability and the deep affordability that's needed um, so, mm. like, so badly in Toronto. Yeah. It's also a perfect way to fuck up a great idea. <laughs> Home, homelessness and you know disadvantaged people all that kind of no, stuff it solves it a lot of should problems work. nationwide yeah. Yeah. no but yeah. it should work but as soon as you throw the government in the mix it just no, he turns said into everything approved. else he didn't say the government he said, oh know, but nationally, nationally approved, approved turns into a gonna... fat bloated profit Private... machine that Private... rapes the government every week <laughs> what's wrong with that no. Extras. no no I mean there's you, you... I mean, I worked in the government for 13 years. I think I did some reasonable stuff there. And the reality is, there's a lot of people there, that, especially in planning, that crave change and progress. And I think I, I, the system is what I find the issue is in a lot of cases. And it's because it is incredibly complicated. There are all sorts of detours and, and problems that can arise. And I think, you know, a lot of people that have aspirations for, you know, what can happen in housing, um, are are stuck unfortunately within a system that makes it really hard to realize some of those goals and ambitions and then there's the political aspects of it as well i think what you see in this bill is you know things like and, and maybe maybe this is a good segue onto the next section uh, which is the three units on a lot where you know the what the province can do is they can you know mandate uh, changes to zoning and policy in municipalities across the province to allow for the creation of more housing as of right. What I mentioned earlier about timing and certainty, that's one of the ways you, you do it. If you want to see more housing get built, just make it as of right. Allow people to build more housing on properties that exist. And so one of the things that the province did uh, through this act was uh, they're allowing for three units on uh, all residential lots, basically a everywhere um so where even in areas where right now you have a you can only build a detached house and maybe a basement apartment you could build a triplex or you could build a duplex in the front with a unit in the back in a laneway suite or a garden suite so you know and, and daryl i know we've talked about it before you know the the incremental impact of missing middle housing but i think it's a i think it's an important change not so much for toronto because you can already do this in toronto because you can build a laneway suite or a garden suite anywhere, and you can have a two-unit house in the front anywhere in Toronto. But in municipalities that have been reluctant for reasons to updating their zoning bylaws to include more of this kind of housing, could it go further? For sure. You, you, you could. Didn't you tell me about a, a a property in Richmond Hill that you severed? Was that you? Uh, or Vaughn? I don't know who I was talking to. But yeah, so... I was. Well, I was. I was at the Richmond Hill Committee of Adjustment for a severance a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, but isn't that kind of out of the ordinary? Like you, you had mentioned it. Like it was like. Oh, um, I mean, I might have just mentioned it because I think it was the first time I'd done anything in Richmond Hill, and it was oh. a fascinating experience. <laughs> oh. Um, but no, it was a severance in a in a, you know, a, an area with rather large lots, and it was it was interesting to see because we're talking about lots that are i think fifteen thousand square feet minimums and we were proposing to create two lots that were i think twelve thousand five hundred square feet so you could drive by those lots and not really know that there was much of a difference and yet unless you were the neighbor <laughs> but even could you you know that's a that's negligible right and and so but that was the concern that came up in front of the committee was, you know, this is going to destabilize the character of the neighborhood. Right. This is going to ruin people's home values. No, it's not. If I honestly, you know, over the past 10 years being or, or 15 years of being a planner, I would love to get back in touch with all the people who told me that one thing I was working on or another was going to tank their property values. I wish they would call me so I could ask them, how did that work out for you? Because I don't think there's a single case of it being a negative outcome. So what about anyway. all these properties in Mimico? Remember Mimico was a whole thing where people were yep. severing lots and then everybody went friggin' bananas and then people that were in the middle of the process because their neighbor was able to do it all of a sudden weren't able to sever their properties. So is that is this all fair game now? If I have a 50 foot lot somewhere, can I cut it into 225s with no appeal? 
Well, you, you got to get approved by the, the city in order to have no appeal for that. So severances are a little bit different than the, you know, a triplex or a, a two unit house with a garden suite, right? So that's, you're talking about something a little bit different. Um, the, in order to get a consent or a severance approved, you still have to meet the, the policies of the city's official plan and uh, generally create lots that reflect, you know, what the area is zoned for as well. You may need minor variances associated with that. Um, but, you know, in, in, in some areas, it may be more possible than in others. Communities are generally uh, reluctant to support severances. People don't like lot splitting. They look at it as a bad thing. Um, generally, I don't. You know, I think it's a, a very good way to increase density in the urban area, areas that are already serviced, um, you know, without getting into the economics of it. I think that's that's ultimately the way we have to grow is is in the cities, in the areas that are already built up both because that it makes sense from a planning point of view, but it also makes a tremendous amount of sense from a city revenue point of view. You know, if you, if you're allowing people to create incremental units all over the existing city where you don't have to build new pipe services or new roads, you just have to improve things over time. Um, that's, that's a lot easier on your budget. You effectively increase the amount of tax revenue that you're collecting because there is more units in an area without necessarily having to increase um, you know, the tax rate, which nobody likes. So, which is why it doesn't happen terribly often. And, you know, you could argue why we're in a situation we're in now in terms of funding, um, you know, things that cities need to continue to operate. Anyway, so I'll stop. I have, a, I have a question for Paul, actually, just on, on, like you said, the entrepreneurial side. So like the people, like your clients, the people who are coming to you right now, like what, what are the typical situations that you're facing, right? With these changes, is it more optimism? Is it, is there, are they more, are they pessimistic because prices are coming down? Like what's sort of the overall tone that your clients have right now? That's a funny question. So when <laughs> I remember when the original Bill 23 legislation was first proposed, I remember that afternoon, I missed 35 phone calls uh, from clients being realtors, being developers, uh, custom home builders. So the the spectrum of excitement, I would suggest is is across the board, right? It's and it's it's not only excitement about obviously, you know, the real estate market is taking a bit of a hit recently. And, you know, there has been a, a bit of a slowdown as it relates to construction on some projects and what people are anticipating for construction in the next, you know, 12 months. So I think this legislation perhaps definitely is exciting people. And it's also making them relook at their existing assets. Um, if you have a site that maybe, you know, has some planning approvals from a number of years ago, but some of these policies might allow for potential additional intensification, especially around MTSAs, which I'm sure we're going to get to shortly. I think that's perhaps where some more of the excitement is coming from, um, because this is obviously going to change, um, you know, how we treat those sites, how we look at intensification and what the minimum requirements are for density around those areas. I feel it like we're like all, excitement, right? yeah, I feel like, like we're all, like, I feel like we're all excited, but like, it's all like, we didn't get what we we're really excited for yet. I think there's that's and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's where the majority of details still need to be unfolded. Like if you look on, there's a lot of good law firms that have done really good summary about number of the um, the proposed legislative changes, and some of them, for example, are in force um, as of November 28th. However, there's many of them that are still to be determined. Um, whether it's you know dealing with some specific matters related to parkland or inclusionary zoning. Um, or specifically the implementation for conservation authorities or upper tier municipalities. There's a lot of details in this legislation that I think everyone is still waiting for the second shoe to drop to really figure out how to assess this. And which, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, Greg. which is Greg the keeps telling me to wait for the next shoe. I can't well, wait the, anymore. The Where's the shoe, right? man? The, the the other shoe is the regulations that inform um, the legislation that passed. So so uh, we're not sure when that's going to come out, but that provides clarity on certain things that that Paul's talking about um, the to the tone in, in so I'm, many areas. The tone that I'm getting, and it's like I know it's wrong, but I'm hearing it from so many different people, clients, and you know, developers, and and different people in construction, and definitely people who don't know what they're talking about. Is everyone just thinks it's going to be like a free for all? They're like, oh, it's just density is coming. It's just like if you build anything you want wherever you want, it's like Doug Ford's going to make it happen, you know. And I think that's like the ambiguity is very clear just with that one sort of sentiment is like no one really knows exactly what this means yet and what it's going to look like and which areas will be targeted the the the, the most. 
Well, I think, I mean, there's, there's some, some things that we know, right? Like Paul mentioned major transit station areas, MTSAs, and, and that's, you know, those are policy areas within uh, 500 to 800 meters of major transit infrastructure. And those areas were identified by the province for intensification. Again, it makes planning sense. You want to build a ton of housing, build it in areas where you have good transit connectivity and, and services and density. Uh, ma- majors defined by what? Just so our listeners, like subway stations, like station. go, go tra- yeah, go subway sta- stations. subway stations, go stations, light rail stations. Um, oh, as well. Okay. And and so there's so cities have undertaken studies of areas around these transit stations. And they have amended their official plans, um, the official plan being the big citywide land use document that all cities have. It's it's a step above the zoning bylaw. Um, I think I've talked about official plans on the show last time I was here. But anyway, they've amended the policies that allow for development around these major sta- uh, transit station areas, uh, or they've recommended amendments. And so those amendments go to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And what this bill does is it requires that once the minister approves those policy changes that introduce new density around the major transit station areas, um, the and, and the minister can approve those um, policies as is, the minister can change those policies in any way that they see fit. And, and then those are given back to the city, those are enacted basically. And the city then has one year from the time that those policies are in place to uh, upzone the area to meet those minimum density requirements. So when I mentioned as of right zoning earlier, this is a good thing. You know, if you own sites in these areas, all of a sudden you might have as of right development permission. So all you have to do is get an architect and a, you know a bunch of consultants to come in with studies necessary to inform a site plan control application, which is a very technical exercise. It's not generally appealable um, by third parties, and you know it's just a step on the way to get a, getting a building permit happens much faster. So that's a, that's a good thing. You know, that will, um, you know, help the creation of housing in major transit station areas, but it's not, you know, I wouldn't say it's widespread, you know, like there's like a lot of areas, particularly, you know, stable neighborhoods, low rise neighborhoods. There's not an awful lot of change that's going to happen in there. Um, under, under bill 23. You talk to more well-informed people than I do. (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're you're having conversations with people who are reading They're my people are just reading the headlines they're saying look i heard there's more density all right i don't know i'm going to do four stories and i i'm i'm in a semi and you know leslieville right like that's just how people are right is they hear yeah. this yeah so, so- okay i still think you have to be strategic about this um especially you know I, i'm advising clients like we still have to wait for some of this um, some of these items to, like I said, the, the second shoe to drop, but no, it's, I don't think it's going to be density everywhere. It's not going to be a quote unquote free for all. I think it's going to be very targeted and generally strategic about where growth, uh, where growth and density happens still. So, but what are the chances that they actually give a decent amount of density where they're saying they're going to, and is it, is it a cap or is it a floor? Because I imagine it's a floor, right? And mm-hmm. and what a floor does is it, the sellers go, holy cow, like this is at least worth this. And if they get even more, then it's worth that. And then some guy from Collier's or CBRE goes in there and says, you know, I can get you like 20 million bucks for your property next week when this new legislation comes out. Um, and and guess what happens initially to all all of these properties unless they're already purchased right when when the legislation changes but as people like people have been kind of gearing up for this right so i i from my perspective i haven't seen especially in these kind of areas I, I have definitely seen activity pick up and i have not seen prices go down on the land at all if anything i've seen it go up so so, so oh go ahead Daryl. Well, I, I mean, it may help us get some more houses on the market, but is part of the legislation supposed to be affordable or did we throw affordable out the window when we created the word attainable? Well, so that, that definition of attainable, at least from my uh, my read on it, there's still there's still a lot to be determined on that. They've uh, they've provided the I'll call it again, the draft of the legislation, but the devil is still in the details. So, um, I think the category of attainable housing, they've created the framework for it to be there, but it's to be defined in future regulations. So, so, but if you buy something where, where 
uh, the prices have gone up. Now you have to get more density in order for the, the project to make sense. And so that you can sell it, make a profit and kind of be near market conditions at, at that point in time. Like everything just kind of, I feel like, like what's the chances really that they're going to go, okay, you know what? It's near a subway station, like at least 40 stories, right? They're not. Most of the subway stations, it's going to be like 14 stories or like 12 or 20 <laughs> stories. And and what's going to happen is the people that sell the land are going to be like, oh, maybe they're going to get 20 stories. So the price is this now. And now the guy who buys it, he kind of has to get 20 stories now for it to make. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Like, Well, we got to I think the province and the cities have to work together on addressing that. Um, and I hope. Oh, we put a pin in that for a sec because I want to take a step back and talk about the affordability piece of the bill because there is um, changes to inclusionary zoning in there. And if uh, you're, you're unfamiliar, inclusionary zoning is a requirement where new developments uh, in certain locations and of a certain scale are required to provide a certain percentage of units, whether ownership or rental, for that'll be rented or sold at affordable rates. And the city, I believe it was last year, uh, acting on regulations that were passed by this current provincial government or well in their last term but the um, same provincial government enacted uh, inclusionary zoning regulations the city then uh, put together their own inclusionary zoning framework and it had a bunch of requirements in it one of the one of the criticisms that was received was that the in order to pay for the additional um, affordable units that were required in development, there was no additional density, additional height, additional, you know, any bonusing that was introduced. And, and so the idea was that it would um, really come out of the cost of the market units, making market units more expensive to subsidize uh, a percentage, whether, you know, it was five, six, seven percent of units within the development as being affordable. And the depth of affordability was something that was prescribed as well whether it was 80% or 60%. So, and, and there were a number of different market areas that the city identified for where this would apply. In any event, um, without getting into details, the Bill 23 uh, effectively changed that to, to maintain inclusionary zoning, which is objectively a good thing, but put a 5% cap on the number of units that are to be provided and cap the affordability at a, a maximum of 80% um, market or AMR, uh, average market rent, as the case may be. So that, you know, introduces, I think, a little bit, you know, more certainty into the, you know, into the inclusionary zoning framework. I mean, Paul, you, you've had a couple of files where it's been an implication um, kind of before I came on board. What, what are your thoughts on the changes to IZ? Yeah, I think um, it definitely is intended to provide a, a bit more certainty to, um uh, to the obviously financial cost for a, for a project there to your point though uh, Greg I mean depending on where you're located if it's an MTSA perhaps you're getting some more density but on some of these sites um, in certain neighborhoods you're not necessarily getting more density you might still be a you know the existing guidelines that pertain in that neighborhood might still apply um, I know there's been fear that this inclusionary zoning piece and affordable housing piece is going to be completely taken away by this this you know, uh, current government, I'm not explicitly seeing that, um, at least from my read of the legislation. Yeah, they, there was a fear that that was the case. Um, and it's, I mean, the rules have changed a bit. And, you know, that appears to be what they're going to be going forward, barring any anything additional in the regulations. The other thing that the province did, and this is one of the more um, contentious points in the legislation, is with regard to rental um, replacement policies. Now, I think only Mississauga and Toronto actually have rental replacement policies. And I'm more, I'm much more familiar with Toronto's. In the case of Toronto, if you have a site with six or more units, uh, rental units, and you're redeveloping that property, you are required to replace all of the units at, a, at similar sizes and similar rents for a period of time within the new development that you're building. And so that's, that's an added cost. Um, but I think it's a very important policy because, you know, it, there's criticism that the current rental replacement rules sterilize some development sites and make, make developments uh, more challenging. Um, and that, you know, is probably the case from a financial perspective, but I think, um, removing those rules entirely 
will exacerbate the problem of affordability by forcing more people out of otherwise, you know, historically affordable rental units into areas where they're not able to, you know, afford things. I think it becomes a, a problem very quickly. There are other ways to go about making it easier for rental replacement to be provided in buildings. But the key thing, the key takeaway here is that the province uh, hasn't actually released any of the things they want to change with the rental replacement policies. Uh, they've just suggested they are looking at regulating them in a different way. So everything that's been kind of speculated so far is exactly that. They they, they don't know exactly what they're going to change. I, I hope that the backlash about that piece of the legislation has been heard by the province and um, and they're not going to do anything to, to undermine the ability of cities to require rental replacement. Because, you know, in the case of Toronto, I've worked on several applications where it's been required and it's the, you know, those projects have still proceeded. And what's an example, Greg, just so my, my brain's not thinking of what the government would suggest that would lead to this being a benefit. Like what are people are afraid of that? They would remove it altogether, that they would yeah. uh, change, change, you know, how many or maybe a percentage of them. They were going to remove it altogether. And what you end up with is a bunch of displaced people uh, in an apartment building uh, that nobody owes anything to them to replace at a reasonable affordable level like you're talking people yeah. that have been in a two bedroom that's 1200 1400 square feet for 750 bucks for the last 30 years right so where the hell are they gonna go when they've been living at like young and bluer right for the last 30 years and now the next comparable rent for them is in their area 3600 bucks or 4800 bucks or i mean so th so the the, the reason I mean, I'm asking this is because the government would be saying the reason we would remove that if that was what they're suggesting, it would spur more development. Well, so what happens Therefore, creating is more homes faster, which is the theme of the bill, right? Is that right? Yeah, but uh, you got to I mean, there's a spectrum of housing that you have to keep in mind. Right. And ultimately, if people are unable to afford housing and, and they become unhoused, that becomes the city's responsibility. That becomes a big problem. You know, there's there's shelter uh, spaces that the city is having trouble keeping up with um, the constructing affordable housing is very challenging to do to meet the you know incredible need in the city right now and so by removing the requirement for rental housing that's affordable to be replaced in developments you're just adding on to that problem and and for what like there there are remedies to this you know and and part of it is allowing for more growth generally in the city opening up more areas for growth you know allowing for more development to happen because you know maybe that 12 unit building uh, that's in a desirable area maybe the numbers don't work on redeveloping it um, and maybe that's fine because if the city were to open up opportunities on a number of other sites for development in that area that was a greater density you're going to get that housing anyway the other thing that the province could consider doing is offsetting the cost of market units constructed in um rental replacement buildings you know where you where you're replacing x amount of units you get credited for the development charges for your market units and that helps offset the cost you know those are things that can happen wouldn't the same argument be used though, like rent control, right? Like rent control, they're saying, well, if people can just raise the rents to whatever they want, then it's going to give all these people who are in these buildings the inability to pay their rent, but it's going to create more supply, which overall is going to bring down the market price of renting, right? So isn't this that same argument where technically removing rental replacement, you could actually spur two times more you know, units that would be built over the next 30 years, which would then bring down the rental market for everybody long-term? Isn't that the yeah, argument? Yeah, I mean, if you... That is the argument. I, I think it's more complicated than that, especially in Toronto, where there's so many different inputs into, you know, the people's affordability. I, I, I think in the long term, if you relax regulations, yeah, you're probably going to get more housing. But I think in the short term, you create some very challenging problems for people. And it's, hard. it's hard to make a deal pencil when you have to give up a bunch of uh, rental replacement units and on top of that, um, inclusionary zoning units, mm -hmm. right? plus pay for the bloody land. It's like, it's I, I just think we've got like 50 years of like laws that have been pro like the people and keep things down and it's not working. So like, why don't we just shift everything over to the developer side of the, you know, pie and say, okay, guys, build more housing. We're going to relax all the restrictions, build as much as you can. And we'll see where the market is in 10 years. And then we'll figure out if it worked or not. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's working right now. And they've been trying to with this rent control and stimulating growth and all that stuff. Like, I don't feel like it's working. That's my opinion. I guess it depends who you ask. I mean, in terms of uh, whether whether the regulations favor 
existing residents or not. I think in some cases they sure, certainly do. Um, others would say that, you know, they're, right now the provincial government is very supportive of the development industry. And I think they've been taking steps to, to do that. I, I still, you know, I'm torn between the, the idea of, um, you know, we, in the short term, removing protections for, for people that are in those situations is, is, you know, it, it would be, it would be disastrous. And if the upshot is that we get more housing built in 30 years, it's good. There's a lot of other ways to do that, which doesn't sacrifice the short term, the short term problems. And that's to expand our growth areas. And that's to do some of the other stuff that's in this bill too, which is, you know, reduce development charges on new builds, um, remove them entirely from the creation of affordable units, which always should have been the case, uh, reduce parks levies. Um, you know, when you do that, you create a more supportive financial environment to build stuff, even when you're replacing rental units, like the, you know, I mean, to talk about parks levies, Paul, I, I know you've got stories about that, of, of the costs of some of these municipalities, like, but, yeah, uh, I think the Parkland fee um, changes that are proposed are are substantial. Um, they provide a lot more certainty for development, especially on high rise projects in some of the 905 municipalities like Toronto Parkland fees are um, not obscene. Um, however, without naming specific municipalities, I I, I've so. seen. Yes, um, <laughs> I've seen I've seen costs of Parkland levies being significantly higher than even the cost of acquisition of a site. So you could pay $10 million and your parkland levies are $15 million. Um, it's, 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 it's substantial and it, it ruins pro formas. It, it ruins potential for um, developing these lands. Um, so when you, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because you see the media and the pushback that we've seen from even some municipalities saying, you know, you're taking billions of dollars out of our coffers by reducing these parkland levies. And I, you know, I think about it objectively and I'm like, I don't know if you would get those units built anyway under your current parkland fees, number one. And number two, if you just approve double the amount of housing, you don't lose any dollars in parkland fees. Charge half it's, the fees and build double the units. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Like, I think if I, if I knew what size park I had to put on the property, like I could do a really nice park for way less than I would have to give to the city. And I could probably like maintain it forever for less too, but like you, okay. So you guys keep saying something that, that is interesting to me because when we're buying land to redevelop, I mean, the, we, we have no certainty. Okay. And so you're touching on a couple of things that add maybe a little bit of certainty to things, which is, which is fantastic. But the one thing that we need the most certainty on, seems to be impossible to give anybody like if you cap the property and you say look it's 20 stories and i don't give a shit what you bring in and who your planner is and who your municipal lawyer is it's 20 stories do whatever you want underneath it but you have 20 stories that changes things right now it it creates a value for that property right a maximum value for that property and that makes things so much easier and it creates certainty we know what's going to get built here right yeah. there's no argument now we don't have to go back and forth with wonderful people like greg for years to figure out the same 90 by 90 box that's on every other site right we just know that we're going to build that 90 by 90 box right out of the chute well we're we were working on something in milton where there was a minimum and a maximum density threshold on a bunch of the sites um, in a growth area. And that was, I think, tremendously helpful because we knew here's what you're, here's the area you're building within prop like the, the building meets all those criteria and it's, it's proceeding like this, like you said, the certainty. I mean, that is when I used to work at the city, I, I would, you know, tell people that I worked with that the time is really the only leverage that we've got. If you can commit to moving something through the process quicker, you know, you can, uh, you can usually negotiate more out of it and and get where you want to be. You know, the longer things drag on, the less certainty there is, the more costs there are for the per person carrying the land. And so, you know, some of what the you know previous legislation in the province has tried to implement um, looks at timing of development approvals with, you know, application fee penalties for that. And, and some of what this current uh, legislation does is tries to create more certainty around development charges by making sure that, you know, they're, they're updated once every 10 years instead of every five years and that they're phased in over a certain period of time. Um, you know, there's, I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but that and the parks levy changes, I think, you know, make sure that certain lines in, in your pro forma are 
more certain and, and may cause people to proceed with projects they might otherwise not. So, but that, that's, so, a, that's an interesting thing to actually get into the weeds on because the timing, the, the amount of money people are paying for that time while waiting for for answers and and planning staff and whatever the hell we wait for that can significantly reduce the the, the costs right no problem uh, that can that can significantly reduce the cost of of a project so i i just feel like you know this whole thing is just added more gray to something that could very easily by the four of us right now create a whole bunch of black and white Right. I mean, I really I've been asking TK every time we talk about uh, am I boring you to sleep, TK? Am I sleeping you, or am I just frozen? I, were you, maybe you're frozen like you look like you're <laughs> asleep. But like I keep calling for a playbook, man. Just give me a playbook. Give me a handbook that gives me the guidelines. And don't just give me guidelines that are only guidelines. Like give me a rule book that says this is the rules. Mm -hmm. Go. And I think everybody will be able to work within that playground a lot better. Well, that's what ostensibly the zoning bylaw, right? And yet the zoning bylaw in most cities in Ontario are, are very much out of date. And yeah, I also think, I think it's very unhelpful too when the zoning is the baseline for a conversation on what gets developed. Because when I was working on like Honest Ed's, the tallest building you could build on there under the zoning bylaw was 14 meters high. It's absurd. You know, of course it should be taller than that. And yet people are, are coming up to me saying, well, the law says, you know, the rules say this is what it is. So they're asking for so much more. And I'm like, yeah, but that's an unrealistic place to start. Come on. So right. that's a, and that, that just comes down to capacity building and people understanding how this process should work, but up zoning. Yeah. Imagine if you just said everything downtown core now, 25 stories minimum. Or maximum. Everything's 25 stories, guys. Go, like, go. Yeah, I mean, there's your get Manhattanization the land, the of Toronto, and right? make it go. Good. What we're going to do is we're going to have to get you guys End both back part on the show yeah. next year and uh, figure out another day. So maybe after the second shoe falls and you guys find out more information and we kind of have a bit, little, bit, little bit more clarity and uh, we can rewatch this first episode and see how many points that, uh, you know, we were able to predict and, and which ones came true or not. But um, we appreciate it, guys. This is great. I think Listeners are going to get a lot out of this. And um, Paul, where can people find you for, for your company? What's oh, the easiest sure. way to connect with you guys? Uh, fastest way, just go to uh, batori.ca. All of our emails are uh, are there and you can feel free to reach out to us. Great. And Greg, Thanks. where do people find you? Same place, B-A-T-O-R-Y.ca. And our contact Social media, anything is on else there. you want to you put any social up? or? Yeah, uh, Greg Ewins, at Greg Ewins on Twitter. I think it's the only one Perfect. I'm on anymore. That's okay, so. yeah. Yeah, beauty. But, we appreciate uh, it, guys. Thanks sign so much up for, for their us. newsletter. They got a great monthly newsletter. Check it out. We'll put a link in the description below. Thank you, Daryl. Appreciate that. Thank you, guys. All right, we'll talk soon. Appreciate your time. Here's everyone. Enjoy Thank the day. You. Take care. Thanks, guys.